achieved high popularity, notoriety, and some esteem, uh, having assembled images which have uh, absolutely no, no meaning at all or no relationship. There then is the limits, let me go back to that, limits of allusion and limits of illusion. There is a limit beyond which you can no longer make references. First of all, there are no references unless you know the reality in the first place, meaning that all of us here must know what a snake is or a ribbon is or what lust is or whatever in order to make the reference possible, functional, so that we can go no further than lead people beyond or very much further from the reality itself. And then if you have references and remove things out of context, which of course is very common now, the very fact that you removed it from its original context means that you've broken the very idea of it and the very meaning of it. It no longer exists in the new uh, context. This is a a shocking and very beautiful statement of truth. This is a bauxite quarry cave in southern France. It is a true symbol. The cave then, which rather obviously represents the return of the prenatal state and one's forthcoming from that an experience of rebirth. This is a tremendously powerful thing architecturally, unintended, not done by any architect, but simply these things we come upon which put us to shame as architects who are somehow uh, carried away by our little eccentricities. Here in Bogota, Colombia, I took this photograph of an old salt mine, and it's not just by chance that the Roman church took this over as one of their central shrines. This then represents, if you will, the Mother Earth, the Rock of Ages, the return to nature herself, getting into the earth. The house, as I mentioned, which is feminine and the repository of wisdom is then the interior rooms and passages represent the various levels of the psyche. This is a plan of a house I designed in 1953 if you want to know when postmodern started. It started pretty much when, when uh, Pay, Barnes, uh, Johnson, um, Rudolph, and myself got out of Harvard in 1943. Well, then there was the war. As soon as that was over, and this is 53, we started moving things in ways which were really quite interesting and immensely free. This is a plan which represents the living compartments of almost a caveman. It is built of very thin shell sprayed concrete on sprayed on a mesh, which was not done in, in, in reality until probably 10 years after this. This predates um, um, the endless house by Frederick Kiesler. But this then represents, if you will, the meaning uh, of a house. The central parts are the sources of water, of fire, of, of uh, cooking, light, and warmth at the very center. Out from that then are buildings which radiate out into bedrooms, uh, studies, and the upper left you see an actual bud which burst out there to accommodate two children when they were added to the family circle. On the old lower right you see a terrace and a pool and a windshield. So these things were studies that I made rather early. This is a house by uh, Archer Graham, I believe, and it is an inflated house. It is all made as a balloon. It is all blown up. But regardless of how advanced or how primitive technology is, it is still possible, you see, to express the wonderful aspects of the human psyche and the few aspects of the experience of living uh, in a home. Now the forest. <clears throat> this is not far away from you here. The forest is another great true symbol. It represents then the mystery, the uncertainty of moving through. It's life. It's not knowing life. It's not knowing what turn to take, what knowing what the, what the consequences will be, that only God can look down and see you fumble your way through. The labyrinth is another aspect of this. This is a very beautiful 
aspect of it in architectural terms, Saint Philibert in France. This then is not the column of trees, but the column of a column of um, goodness. I'm having a hard time with this. There we go. Uh, architectural columns. You can see then how very uh, similar this is. A more advanced uh, aspect of the forest might be a uh, structure of this sort. This is again my design model for the uh, resort hotel in Miami Beach where you see <clears throat> a huge uh, <clears throat> all over structure and uh, inclined elevators, the little red dots. Uh, below is a lagoon uh, the yellow element is an, uh, um, uh, a UFO bar, a flying saucer bar, uh, and I'll show you other aspects of it as we go along. But you see, each time there can be an updating from the natural state to the uh, Romanesque church in France uh, to a high technology in which we are dealing with the same uh, aspects and experiences. And then there's the bridge. <clears throat> this is uh, a Brooklyn Bridge. This will take you as a, br as a bridge should um, from one uh, <clears throat> reality to a suspension in time and space to the reality of Manhattan. In our time, of course, it is the airport. This is the extension of the building to the fuselage of the plane. This then has to do with not only the preparation of man for flight, which might be considered metamorphosis, in which you undergo psychologically the change from walking on foot to actually, not actually, but having psychologically the feel of wings that you give over to other, other ways of travel. This is a very powerful uh, idea. This then is the updating of the bridge. No one, as I know, although we have some magnificent uh, airports, has ever given it expression at all. Who understands what the psychoanalytic aspects are? Who knows what it should mean to people being prepared for flight coming off uh, t from taxis and buses and on foot and so, and going into chambers of preparation and then through these extension tubes into that plane. We all go through this, we all feel it, and it's not a living architect possibly uh, uh, Aero Saron, who did that expressive thing in New York, hardly an architect who has even put his mind to it. And then the galaxy, another great image. This is for all time known as the home of the gods, a true symbol. I've used that. Well, this is one of Philip Johnson's very near here which I hope to see while I'm here. Uh, I'll have to reserve judgment until I do. But this, to me, is a chrysalis. It's beautiful, at least on the inside. It represents, though, a very wonderful um, um, silken quality in which these congregations are th swathed, you see, and brought into, then, a experience of rebirth. This, of course, is what the silkworm goes through before he emerges with wings. It's a very beautiful idea. I don't think Philip Johnson has thought about it. I have. I'll write him a letter and tell him. Why do I have to do his homework for him? And here is my version. At the top of this marvelous hotel is the uh, cloud room. This then is the inner, inner um, faith uh, chapel, and you reach that with a little red elevator which goes up and disappears into the cloud. <laughs> now it's funny, but it's also dead serious. It's one of the biggest things I've done in, in the last decade, I would say. The tower, finally. This is Watts Towers, very near here too which represents aspiration, a true symbol of aspiration, to uh, things uh, other earthly, beyond the earth, the heavenly, spiritual, and so. As <clears throat> opposed to this one, the great uh, Hong Kong Bank by Foster, which represents power and wealth, and probably hebris or overweening pride, which the Greeks gods would slap you down for. A very beautiful building, I think one of the very best of our time. It is organic, 
It is built like a tree with branches. It is high technology, and it is indeed a great symbol as well. It's very difficult to bring all of those together in some sort of balance. Now, just a few more things here. I made a study of, or rather the regional plan organization in New York made a study of how to save New York. And they, 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 they began with the idea that the cross traffic in blue, which are the subway systems, which come together at a stop there, and then there's an interchange which is the yellow, meaning you can go up, you can cross the tracks, and from there you can move to any one of four blocks. This is, of course, very dense development in the center of any urban, urban, uh, urban uh, center. From that, then, the elevator systems bring you up into, into four buildings. This is a, a marvelous uh, piece of organization. Out of that, then, came <clears throat> this model, which uh, is all right as far as it goes, but is where we begin as architects, I would say. It is totally lacking in any expression uh, whatsoever. On the basis of this, I made a, a series of three drawings which might amuse you. The plan below is the same plan you saw before. The green, you see, are, are the subways or transportation and services. Uh, the uh, elevators are, again, in, in vertical. They are green. Uh, the red is structure and dots, and, and so this is then techn technological expression uh, of what a, these buildings might be. The offices or apartments are plug-in elements, prefabbed, uh, inflated sky rooms, uh, tech, uh, telecommunication centers, HVAC, all of these things are represented uh, by a, a, a color coding. Uh, bridges across, street levels, theaters, and uh, very specialized spaces. Now this would be a way I forced myself <clears throat> into expression purely on technological terms uh, to deal uh, with that uh, organization of the city. If I were then to follow this up as organic aspects of urbanism, I would see the green same, not as subway, but as a root system, as growth by layering, meaning the extensions out by the system of root extensions, which is the way uh, many plants uh, actually grow. The structure then is in red. The vertical fibrovascular distribution of services goes right up the stem as the elevator, the telecommunications, the air can, a, H, H, VAC, and all of that went. There's a skin on the outside, which in this case is called the epidermis. The, uh, the fibrovascular bundles uh, carry the circulation, as I say, up. That is called the mesoderm. And the organs at the ends are flowers or leaves, and they are the similar. They would correspond then uh, to the <clears throat> rooms, the theaters, the uh, elements of very special use. Or they might be called uh, uh, <clears throat> internal organs. <clears throat> To express this then in psychosocial psycho terms, you would have on the left a, um, a corporate tower uh, symbolized by battlements, which represent strength, power, defense, wealth. Uh, the one on the right then is an aspirational spiritual tower, which points to, to God or to the heavens. Um, if you can read any of that, it, it, you, uh, you will find that the inserts there are cor uh, corporate ritual settings, uh, rooms for the board of trustees to meet in, uh, special rooms below, the court of law, a drama theater set, <coughs> a treasury vault in the basement, a drawbridge, which is a, 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 um, a, a graphic way to represent a security system, which of course they have at their door. The total Im image is then a power as a corporate power or a, a, a very sensate uh, expression. You see the same thing in plan. The mask hung on, hung on the outside, again, is personae. I don't suggest literally hang masks on buildings, but this then would suggest to you that this mask or facade uh, inspire uh, trust and uh, goodwill and uh, hail fellow well met step right up and call me Jack, uh, you can trust me, I'm one of you guys, you know? This is what you get when you deal with corporations. The, um, the uh, facade of the mask, of course, on the religious building, personae again, ins inspires 
love, trust, and comfort. The tower, the tower at the top is swathed in a cloud then, which is the setting, which is the home of the gods. In every case, the sun is shining up there. It is a source of power and, uh, um, and heat in, in technological sense, but of course it represents the divine and uh, the universal uh, forces. Uh, below then you see uh, the uh, ritual chamber. Uh, on the right uh, you see the vault where the gold is kept on the left. These are very different expressions. But this then suggests an opportunity for architects to move in to buildings which <clears throat> have not yet been expressed, or rather frivolously, and perhaps uh, make uh, something of that. Man in space. <clears throat> we advance then <clears throat> using our technology, as Debose, Rene Debose says, uh, which we should do with uh, no reservation as long as we uh, use this and make it not incompatible with nature and humanism, as long as we make technology conform to human needs and aspirations. If this is not pleasing to us, it is time then for architects to move in and make it so. But this is then our responsibility. We cannot stop our advance into space and investigative powers. We must then uh, follow this up. This is a beautiful photograph of nature, and we do learn from nature. We are part of nature, and this then is, of course, what Frey Otto uh, did in his beautiful uh, Munich uh, sports buildings, which are only possible by using um, uh, computers. Here is the photograph of the primordial the prototypical hero, John Glenn. We then draw from our psyche. We understand as we look about us what our rituals are, what our current uh, mythology actually is. We are obliged as architects to look around and understand these because uh, we are the more sensitive uh, members of the community who uh, somehow sense this out before others do. This then is the motorcade, which is the ritual, and the setting or theater, the architectural aspect then, uh, is, the, uh, is Pennsylvania uh, Avenue. This is a joke shot. This is uh, the same hero, which is Snoopy, uh, in the Thanksgiving Day Parade, New York City, uh, for children. They uh, then have their mythology too. They indeed have their uh, heroes. And finally, this last shot, which is sobering and challenging and really quite remarkable, because it, reps in, it represents in its time, which is uh, 5,000 years ago, the highest technology known in its time. These stones weigh something like uh, 20 tons each and were lifted in uh, by oxen and by very simple devices, and they still remain true. They, uh, the organic aspect of this is the fact that this is indeed a sundial. It relates man not only to the rest of the uh, orientation on Earth, but to the source, the solar source of his life and of the solar system. The, um, the psychosocial aspect of this thing is, of course, that it was a, indeed a temple. And the mystical qualities of bringing these all together had tremendous compelling power uh, at that time. You may be interesting to know that the sun that rises there comes through that slot and hits a heel stone at the other end of the circle, but it's two degrees off. Well, the archaeologists said they did pretty well. They only missed it by two degrees. And then another wiser archaeologist came along and said, do you know that 5,000 years ago, the earth which wobbles this way brought that sun in exactly on that stone? and only the movement of the Earth in the last 5,000 years has moved it off. That's really sobering. That's really something quite, quite marvelous, I believe. Now, what do we do about our symbols? Symbols cannot be invented, as some postmoderns think they can be. They take centuries to develop. And Jung has said that 
a particular image will surface, I like the word surface, in many people when that image is needed to serve a common cultural problem or give inspiration to that society. In other words, images and symbols, and this is the closing statement, naturally develop out of a society, out of a culture, because they need this. They need it to go by, as they need the scientific truth, they need the mythological truth as well. As far as I know, we have not found the symbols of our time, the symbols for our electronic age, for our information age. We have not yet found or updated our symbols or images for this communication age. Now, perhaps we need someone of the stature of Le Corbusier. I don't know. I do not think, since his time, Corbusier was the first generation modern architect. I'm of the second generation. The third generation are now in their 40s and 50s. And you are the fourth generation. I think it's going to happen in your time. I hope you will listen to this sobering talk, not feel too much um, challenged by it. It's a tremendous time you're moving into of investigation and, and exploration. And there's a marvelous development of architecture for you, the fourth generation out there. Thank you for listening to me.